the way Telnet works, since it's going to line buffer the rest of it. So we'll send that traffic after modifying it. And uh, now it'll send us the rest of the you know, text that we type buffered. It gives you opportunity to modify it and then uh, send it on along. So we save it. You always got to remember to click the Save button. I've forgotten that many times. So we send that along. And now we can look and see, at the, see what text the, uh, the server, the, the intended destination got. And we can also see what the client got. Um, Oh, I didn't send it, sorry. Yeah, it helps if we actually remember to uh, click our send button. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, that's a good example. You know, you have about as long as a TCP timeout to manipulate and modify the traffic in the GUI. So some applications might only give you 15 seconds. Some might give you a lot. That's why we have the ability to copy hex bytes and paste them over the, put, paste them over everything real quickly. Um, <clears throat> all right, so that's, uh, essentially, the, the main function of the, the GUI is you know, editing TCP traffic as it flows through, but it's, it's invaluable when it seems so simple, but it's really invaluable when you're trying to get the traffic and you've been going through layers of SOX proxies and attaching to processes and, okay, where's the send function, you know, reverse engineering using all of your immunity debug or whatever. It, it can be pretty tiring. And that's only if your application, you know, is something in an environment where you can even do that. So this is the, the muck pipe. Um, I wanted to pick a real world example of you know, a protocol that's non-trivial and binary and then show regular expressions operating against it. Um, so our muck pipe more or less replaces NetSed. Um, you know, NetSed is still useful in a lot of places. I've, I still play with it. But uh, you know, our regular expressions are powerful enough now that um, I barely find myself needing it anymore. Um, so what we're going to do is tweak our rule set to just uh, just uh, you know, run the muck pipe on the on the VNC session. Uh, we have it run on port five five nine zero one, uh, and this regular expression uh, it's it's a little uh, there are a lot of backslashes and forward slashes in there, but essentially what it's doing is a, a series of hex characters, and the regular expression format is then a forward slash, and then what you want to replace it with. So what we're going to try and do is replace the letter A as it's sent through the VNC keyboard with the letter B. Uh, we're going to use the on-screen keyboard in, on the victim to show you that we're actually clicking the letter A, and this regular expression is looking for VNC keyboard commands and replacing them. So uh, we'll pull up the on-screen keyboard and the, and the VNC session and uh, walk through that. Wait, let me make sure it's uh, auto-send. There. And uh, if you don't turn on auto-send, then it'll just sit there waiting forever like that. All right, so this is uh, the muck pipe affectionately named by Aaron sitting right there. <laughs> so we're going to be sending the uppercase A character. Whoops. So uh, and that's a really simple example, but I guess if you know you really were passionate about Dvorak, you could remap everyone's keyboards to Dvorak. Um, whatever, it's just a, you know, you can, you can get really crazy with regular expressions. You can actually chain, you know, 10 muck pipe rules. You can I've done some pretty crazy stuff. And each muck pipe rule can have multiple regular expressions that are applied serially. So you can get pretty intricate just with regular expressions, um, as long as you don't get too carried away. You know, at some point, I, I've done things where I'm like, OK, I just wrote you know, 20 regular expressions. Uh, maybe I should have implemented that as a plugin. <laughs> um, but uh, you can get carried away. All right, moving on to our next demo. And that was done in stream, which is the coolest well, part. Well, yeah, it's, it's all happening in stream. It, it, you know, as soon as you change the rule, it's instantly applied, and all the traffic will then have that rule applied. Um, the next uh, plugin we have is image inversion, which you've already seen. But uh, instead of showing you the plugin again, we're just going to show off a little bit of the source code and show that you know, it's only 20 lines of code. And you could essentially do that with anything on an HTTP session. If you want to you know, make the world black and white, replace CSS, you, you know, whatever, any HTTP request or response that flows through, you can do whatever you want. Um, so this is the code. It's um, how many lines is that? Six. Twenty, yeah, oh, six, no. six lines to flip the image using the Python image library, another 10 or 15 to actually implement the plugin, and, and that's it. You don't have to worry about socket code or anything. You have an HTTP request object, do stuff to it, give it back to the uh, gateway, and away it goes. So I just thought about this, too. This is an example of the specific parts of those scripts that we would do all the time without the generic parts that would have to be 
interleave within there to get just the network information. All this is worried about is the logic of the assessment that we want to do, the logic of the data manipulation that you want to, the data manipulation that you want to do. All the networking was taken care of for you. If you just look at these few plugins that we have, you can get up and running pretty quickly. All right, next. Whoops. So um, another thing that we did was, uh, you know, uh, we have a session hijacking plugin, and this is really cool because um, any any host and header cookies that we capture, you know, we um, we can use those and then man in the middle of them, uh, you know, replay those and hijack the session on the Mallory gateway. And you know, session hijacking is one of those things that's been known about for years in HTTP. It's not terribly exciting, but when you actually have to do it and you have to click through, you know, ten steps every time you want to do it in Burp or Peros and replace cookies, uh, it, can, um, it can be very tedious. So uh, a way to automate that process in, um, for mobile devices that we're capturing headers and cookies for and then use just a regular browser to test the application can be, can be pretty useful. Um, so uh, we're going to pull up um, a browser and log into the uh, WordPress admin side of the site and let Mallory collect a few cookies. Um, so he's going to log in as an admin and notice that it's still flipping all kinds of images. Uh, did we get logged in there? Not yet. Oh. So, uh, all right. So as soon as we get authenticated to the WordPress site, uh, you know, you'll see a standard blog uh, management um, screen. It's a little slow because it's running so many VMs. Mm -hmm. So this is being, this is logged in right now in the client VM uh, that's running through Mallory. And uh, now we're in Mallory, and note, in Mallory right now, the gateway itself, we are not logged in. However, if we... All right. And before we go on here, I'd like to explain a little bit about what happened. Uh, there's an HTTP plugin in Mallory that knows how to do uh, session hijacking. Um, it's logging all these cookies because every HTTP request it, it sees and saves that data in memory. Uh, and then we have a separate uh, daemon that when you connect to it, it gives you a a, a bunch of JSON data that represents all that data seen on the screen. So uh, this plugin is essentially, you know, doing an H XML HTTP request and pulling a bunch of JSON back from the Mallory gateway. And now this is a Chrome extension that we wrote, and this Chrome extension will replace all the cookies. And the reason we used an extension is because you can violate same origin policy in an extension and replace cookies for any domain, which is what we want to do. Um, so we click apply and voila, man in the middle. Now every request you make to example.com, the extension is smart and replaces the cookies for you. So uh, it, it makes session hijacking really easy in, I guess, two or three clicks. Yeah, no um, more stopping the set cookie, editing it, sending it off. Like, And if you are using a proxy, um, it'll do this and you can actually just send it to a regular HTTP proxy now with the hijacking already done. So that's kind of nice. Uh, and one of the final things that was just like another random thing was, okay, what if we do have an app that's using DNS and we don't want to have to do anything crazy to send it to an internal server? Like, say we have a binary protocol and we have an internal server that we want to, you know, kind of maybe do some fuzzing, you know, the client. We want the client to go to that server. Uh, we can hijack DNS. Um, so DNS support is just for A records right now, but using the DNS Python library, if you so wanted, you could... Uh, you could implement any protocol that you wanted. I'm sorry, any DNS record type. You can manipulate those. But um, so right now, if you go to CNN.com in the application, oh, it, what? Your name. What? Oh, yeah. You have to take <laughs> our word for this one. You can see actually, if you look at the bottom, it's looking up for slash dot dot org, even though we typed in CNN. We didn't. Uh, this is the only live demo that won't work. But uh, essentially, we'll look. We can take a look, quick look at the code for uh, for the DNS configuration. But Basically, any A record request, you can do simple string matching and replace it with whatever IP you want to throw it off to whatever server you want it to throw off to. Um, so that's just a nice little feature. I figured I'm already the man in the middle. I might as well do stuff like that. Um, so that's a pretty quick example of uh, how to do that. Uh, so it's just a Python dictionary if you're not really fluent with the code. Uh, Python, it's just a data type where, you know, whatever's on the left-hand side gets searched for and it gets replaced with the right-hand side when it sees an A record request flow over. Um, and that is uh, 
basically all the demos we have uh, planned and prepared for. Um, so uh, <clears throat> I guess we'll just do a quick conclusion of you know everything we talked about. Um, Mallory is our generic TCP and UDP man in the middle proxy. Uh, we like it a lot. We use it a lot. Uh, it's extensible. It's versatile. It's open source. With uh, the GUI is actually GPL because it uses PyQD, which is GPL. So uh, any any work done on the GUI would have to be GPL. But the rest of the code base is using the Python uh, Foundation license, which is real liberal BSD like. So there aren't too too many restrictions on how this gets reused. Um, we have a Twitter account that you can follow us. We'll probably, as we add more protocols and make it do more and dance and sing and uh, you know, juggle flaming chainsaws, I don't know. Uh, we'll we'll announce funny. that stuff there. <laughs> um, and you can keep up on the project with, with the Bitbucket, repo Bitbucket repository. You know, they let you uh, subscribe, you know, RSS feed of updates and all that uh, newfangled web 2.0 nonsense. <laughs> uh, so that's it. Uh, that's our uh, proxy, and we hope you enjoyed our presentation. Do we have time for questions? Yeah, so now questions. Yeah. <laughs> we have time. The session hijack, the Chrome plugin, that was the same system as Oh, yes. So the way a lot of the plugins work, especially if the plugin is running some kind of server or some kind of thing that you need to connect into it, is we had we follow this paradigm. Only local hosts can connect to Mallory because we didn't implement authentication or you didn't we didn't want to like have all this sensitive data out if it's on a network or something like that. So it all it checks to see if a local host is connecting to it, and uh, the Chrome extension will only work that way. Or if you do SSH port forwarding, you can make it work through. I guess other mechanisms. I've got it at working on my VPN setups and stuff like that. And the same thing with the SSH man in middling. If you try to netcat to that port outside of the local host, it won't work. We figure with the prevalence of SSH, you can just you know port forward and deal with it that way. Yeah. Any other questions? Cool. Yes. Yeah. Um. So. That was like one of those things where actually, you know, breaking the regular expression apart. Um, in theory, you can do everything that a Python regular expression can do, but right now it's it's limited to most of the stuff you can do in a Python search style regular expression, and then the replace. Um, it, it, pretty much what you saw is what you get. You can you know you can specify the number of counts, you know, the number of times you'll replace, or you know, there's like, or you can set the G flag for replace as many times, but it's What's that? No callbacks. No, not yet. That's like one of those things where it's like, well, I know I'm going to want that someday, but uh, I haven't implemented it yet. So it's. But it's plugins are relatively easy enough to implement as well. So if you can figure that out in some Python way and we give you this object of data, you can start messing with if it. You, yeah, and that might be an ideal place to just write a regular expression plugin where you can do a full featured regular expression. But, you know, because that's in the GUI, it's easy for us to mess with things pretty quickly. Yeah. So we considered doing it asynchronously, but a lot of the libraries um, that we wanted to use, I, I know that um, Twisted has its own SSH library, but um, it seemed like the prevailing paradigm for most of the TCP code out there for Python was uh, you know, standard threaded sockets, and Twisted is asynchronous and has its own way of doing everything. So we really kicked it around, and there were a couple of times where I said, threads are absolutely evil, and I hate threads, and I wish I'd used asynchronous. But uh, I killed those bugs, so now I'm happy. <laughs> and like also a big thing about making a new protocol is like if Python already supports some kind of client library and some kind of server library for a specific protocol, you can just use that kind of stuff. So since a lot of the libraries do use sock, um, threads as opposed to twisted or asynchronous, it was just easier to do it that way. So are you guys going to make plugins for Mallory? <laughs> It's fun. <laughs> Any other questions? Have you plugged this into network buzzing at all? Uh, that's, that's something that I've uh, really been thinking about. And I think that's going to be one of my goals for version two of Mallory because uh, you know, it's an ideal place to do a lot of fuzzing. We just need to figure out, you know, because a lot of protocols, you know, when you look at like uh, the different branches, a network protocol will take like FTP or HTTP, it ends up you know, with a kind of graph or tree structure. So we've got to figure out how we want to replay that and get enough you know, traffic volume.